Well, welcome to another edition of Down the Middle. Uh, I, I'm really excited to continue on this path of educating investors about passive investing, which is what most of the people who are watching this do. This is a YouTube channel. That's how, how millennials have learned to invest. Um, joining me today is Vincent Deloire. He is the global macro strategist at StoneX. Every week he writes reports that guide his company's investors, including big pension funds um, and other institutions. Uh, if you name the financial publication, whether it be the Financial Times, Barron's, the Wall Street Journal, he's in it. He's been, he's been quoted in it. He is considered to be one of the, the world's preeminent uh, experts in how passive investing works or how the exchange traded fund world works that where we most of us invest. Uh, but I want to get into a little bit of his background first. Um, where did you grow up? Who were your who were your biggest in, who were the biggest influencers in your life? Because um, you're clearly coming to us today from California, not Paris. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you, uh, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, pleasure to engage with your audience. I, I love the work that you do. So I'm uh, Thank, thanks for having me. Yes, so I grew up in a small town in, in Burgundy, which is a lovely one country uh, in, in France. Um, and yeah, markets was not necessarily where, where I thought life would, would lead me. Um, you know, I kind of followed a, a very... Uh, traditional path for, for French uh, students, middle class students, you know, you take an exam, you go to a hard school, uh, and then you train to become a, a public servant because this is the most glorious path uh, one can one can follow in France. And um, at the time I did it without much, much thinking. I mean, this is just what you do. I had always had a, an interest, oddly enough, started with coins. Uh, one of the reasons why I hate the euro is because I love the, uh, I love, as a kid, I collected coins from, from every country. I just love the, the image. And I, you know, it made me curious about history. Like, why is this person on this note? And I, I just thought it was really cool. And then, of course, for me, 2002 was a, was a tragedy when, uh, you know, we replaced all these beautiful European coins that had so much meaning with these ugly notes. You know, we couldn't even agree on what we would put on the notes. And that's <laughs> how dysfunctional the EU is. The French correctly said we should put French rain men on it because, you know, we have so many of them. But turns out <laughs> the, the other 16 members of the Eurozone also thought that they had a history that was worth telling. So anyway, we could not agree on anything. And then we just put bridges on there, which is kind of silly. But well, long story short, uh, I studied... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I studied in a, in, a, in a school in Paris uh, with some very famous uh, politicians as, as professors. And, and the more it went, the more um, scared I was, I thought about my destiny. Like, oh, this is going to be what I do for the rest of my life. And I, I got lucky. I got a scholarship to, to study uh, in the U.S., got my master's degree in, in New York. And then this was just before the financial crisis, which meant... If you could open an Excel spreadsheet back in 2006, you could call yourself a hedge fund analyst. Uh, so I was hired by a small research firm out of Sausalito. And of all things, my first job was to track money flows, especially into ETFs and mutual funds. And that really, I think that really framed my understanding of markets, not so much as kind of what I later on with the CFA as the discounted cash flow analysis and all of that stuff, but like realizing that at any, at any point in time, um, the price of a stock is a function of the supply of money that's going in and how many shares are being sold. I mean, I, I like to think of, of the, 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 the stock market as no different from uh, the pork belly market, right? I mean, if you were to analyze the pork belly market, you look at how many porks they are in demand for bacon. So that's how I, I think about the market. And I think that's what it brought me towards that um, obsession with, with passive and its impact on market structure. So um, before we before we go there, I've got a few other questions to get to know you a little bit better. You're, you're clearly ready to jump into the markets, but we're going to we're going to take a step back. Uh, I'm sorry. D didn't you have an interesting professor uh, in Paris when you were studying when you were possibly going to go the path of working in Treasury? Well, actually, I had two interesting professors. Two. Right? OK, let's go. The first one was uh, at the time a very prominent fellow called Dominique Sposkian. 
Uh, that was before 2011 and before he got caught in a, in a nasty hotel room in New York. Uh, but I mean, he, as far as I can tell, he was a, he was a good account professor, uh, <laughs> certainly very smart, very bright person. Uh, some of eventually led to his downfall that were quite obvious already, uh, in school. Uh, but, uh, he, he was, a he was a good professor. And, and then, uh, one of my first TA in, uh, uh, constitutional law was a, a bright young man um, who was destined to a great future called Emmanuel Macron. He was barely a few years older than me and he was already teaching. And I mean, as far as I can tell, he was, uh, you know, I mean, he was almost our age, right? So he was cool to, you know, he was just a fun person to hang out. And uh, I mean, that's, uh, that, but that's the way France works. I mean, it's a very, uh, very close circle of powerful people who kind of go to the same school, right. uh, freaking, uh, you know, hang out together. And I think that to some extent explains some of the, the, the disconnect we're seeing between the kind of the populist revolt, like the Yellow Vest and, and, and an establishment that is not always in sync. Uh, even though as far as I can tell, like, you know, these people are very competent and, and very smart, uh, but there is a, a level of inbreeding that is, uh, I think, problematic. So um, before you... Before you were, were kind of all the way into your career, uh, and this is, I, I went straight from business school to Wall Street. So I, I didn't, I thought about it, but I didn't do it. And, you know, I don't know if I regret it to this day or not, but you are a charter, charter financial analyst. Can you explain what that is? Because a lot, of, a lot of viewers won't know what it is. And can you explain what, how you think it helped you uh, after you got out of business school? Because it's, it's, it's a commitment in and of itself and in a post-COVID world. We've certainly seen a, hu- a dramatic decline in the number of, of, of students who are getting out of business school who are even studying for the, the, the CFA. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, it is, so the CFA is a, it's a nonprofit uh, association that um, initiates a trade group. You can think of it started, I think, out of Boston and New York, just analysts kind of getting together and saying, OK, well, let you know, there was no rule. So let, let's let's first establish a charter of conduct to make sure that we behave ethically and we don't, you know, uh, recommend stocks that we own. Or So there's a, an ethical aspect to it. Uh, and then um, there, there is the uh, exam aspect to it, which grew over time. I think at the beginning, it was just like an, a one-hour exam. And now it, it turned into this, indeed, a uh, very big endeavor. It's, you know, three exams, usually over the course of three years. Most people fail at this one level. Um and it's it's a lot of material. It really is. And I mean, even uh, I don't know. I I thought of you know, I thought I was smart when I <laughs> I did it. I thought, oh, it's piece of no, 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 no one, no one's smart enough. There's just too much stuff, and you, you have to put the hours. But it's good. It gives you a foundation. Like for example, there was areas where I was, you know, econ, quant stuff, easy. But the accounting for me was like, okay, you really need to understand how to read a uh, uh, financial statement. Right. And, this very valuable skill. I mean, well, now it's everything's passive, so you just need to buy the market hold forever. But assuming uh, you know, we we come back to normal capital markets, these are these are very useful skills. I would say um, it's a big investment, it's a big commitment. Um, I would recommend to do it before you have the family life, which is kind of what I did. I, you know, because otherwise it's going to be very hard. You have to book. I would say you know two hours of your day. Yep. for, you know, a couple of months before the exam and, and you have a high chance of failing. But I found it to be a good community. I, I teach, uh, I used to teach at um, the society back in San Francisco. Um, and, and I think, I mean, it kind of depends, but if you are somewhat young and you don't necessarily have parents who were investment bankers or a, you know, a, 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 big, a big job, uh, maybe a, the data spend, uh, <laughs> um, then it, it's a way to kind of differentiate yourself and also communicate to your employer that you are willing to put the, the hard work, um, that you know what you're going to talk about. And, and I think, I mean, there's always a debate, like, should I do the MBA? Should I do the CFA? I mean, I've known great people who've done both. Uh, one thing that I would say in favor of the CFA is that something you can pursue alongside of your career and the investment cost-wise a lot less, uh, a lot lower of than the Right, um, and it also kind of really gives you a feel, you know. And, and if you don't know exactly what it is that you want to do, the CFA is going to 
Great. All right. You know, if you're able to do the CFA, that means you're ready for to in finance. Yep. So it, it's funny you mentioned the choice between the CFA and the MBA. I, I chose to get my MBA in finance. Actually, my second de- master's is from Columbia, so we have that in common. But when people ask me to look back and say, what was your hardest class? I always say managerial accounting. It was, it was a double class. It, I thought it was going to kill me. And yet the skill set that I walked out with in terms of learning that accounting is it's carried me through my career. It's, so I, it resonates with me when you're like, you got to get those skills down. You got to understand how to read a balance sheet. Um, so accounting also helps us count. And um, if you look back to just 11, 12 years ago, uh, according to State, State Street, uh, the assets under management in index funds were just over a trillion dollars. And we're about to cross the $10 trillion mark in ETF passive investing. This is massive, massive growth, 10x in 12 years. Uh, explain, explain the very basic, basic basics. And I, I've asked the same question of a friend of yours, Mike, Mike Green. Explain the very basics of why passive is a misnomer and why passive is actually active. Right. Um, <clears throat> so with passive, I mean, you, you know, you replace the, uh, the role of the fund manager with an index, right? I mean, that's, that's the idea. In, instead of, you know, giving your money to Peter Lynch, you're going to buy a fund that shall be S&P 500 index. So that really just changes the level at which a stock selection decision is made from a, you know, a, a human with his emotions and qualities and flaws to um, the index committee. I mean, for example, take the case of the S&P 500 index. Um, the S&P 500 index is not the 500 largest stocks in the U.S. And even if it were, by the way, that's already a choice, right? You, you, you're choosing 500 companies in one country instead of the potential universe that you could choose. So even if it were a good index, uh, it would already be a choice. In the case of the S&P 500, it's especially active because you have a whole lot of other criteria that go into play. Uh, you have requirements against drought class share, for example, that they come up in 2017, which means that most people miss the rally in the, in the, the big um, tech names because they all have this drought class structure and they got kicked out of the index. But oddly enough, they kept the old one because no one wants to kick out Berkshire or Google or the index. So this is an example of like a weird kind of discretionary decision they made. Or mm-hmm. look at what happened when they included Tesla. I mean, they waited way too long. Uh, and for reasons that were not so clear, uh, and of course, that ended up costing investors a lot of money because they, they missed the big run in Tesla. And then, of course, as people knew that Tesla had to be added, you know, by the time it became like a three, four hundred billion market cap, I mean, you can't get out of the index, right? So then you had all these arbitrageurs that started bidding up the price of Tesla. So if you look at the price of Tesla, I think it was in uh, November uh, 2018, the price just shoots up mm-hmm. before before it gets included in the index. So that just means that effectively you are, um, arbitrageurs are, effectively stealing money from people that are investing in index funds. So you have all these discretionary decisions and you have a lot more also coming with, you know, what, how do you handle stock split, mergers, uh, how you trade when you have inflows and outflows. All these things are not part of the original passive invest uh, philosophy, the, the case that was made by um, <clears throat> uh, Bogle right. uh, <clears throat> and then before before that Bill Sharp, which is so passive that it's kind of like, you know, passive never trades, uh, passive never makes any decision. That's that's the framework, the theoretical framework that academics develops that created the basis for the industry as we know it today. But the industry as we know it today is very different from that. I mean, you have the ESG funds, you have the smart beta, uh, you have sectors, you have thematic stuff. So you can't really say that passive as a whole uh, is really passive. You have a bunch of active decisions that are made, just people are not aware. Um, so... Uh... In May of 2021, so May earlier 2021, you said for now, money will keep flowing into index funds, uh, whether we like it or not. At the same time, bubbles like stars eventually collapse under their own gravity. Those are those are big words. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, it's part of the conundrum of being a, and I, 
I would not necessarily la- la- label myself a critic of passive. Like I, you know, I own um, passive phones. I, I even own target date phones for that matter. And, and, and when my friends ask me for, you know, what should I do for Okay, I mean, you know, I, I tell them, well, you know, buy a total market phone index, you know, Vanguard's very low fee. So I, I'm not, um, you know, ideologically against it. But I, at the same time, I think we need to be cognizant of, um, the, the macro impacts of what you described, which is going from one trillion to 10. By the way, I think it's more than 10 today, yeah. especially to include like the, the um, uh, SMAs and, and the, 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 the strategies that replicate uh, passive indexing that, that you don't see that in, in mutual fund ETF. So I think right now, I would, my estimate is we're close to 50% of the market uh, uh, being run of assets being owned by index funds or strategies that are based off index funds. And then in terms of flows, we're probably looking at more like 90% goes in the strategies. And in terms of trading, it's probably, uh, uh, you know, 90% of trading is in some shape or form the result of passive flows. Um, so, you know, I, I went on a tangent and I forgot to question. Um, oh, you, you, you quoted the, it felt like so rabbit. Yes. So, yes, for now, it's going to keep happening. It's, it's just, at this point, it's just, it's a, it's a machine. It has its own momentum. It's built in especially with the, the new uh, the, the DOL guidance on 401ks that basically puts people by default into target date funds that then get allocated into the next one. So basically every time the American get paid, there's a portion of a paycheck, uh, you know, anywhere between five and 10% that goes in a retirement account or 401k. And then unless they make an active decision not to go with it, that gets invested into a target date funds, uh, but which ultimately gets uh, all the way down to an index fund. So, so when you, you have... A, a, a moment like we are today when wages are soaring by 20% over year over year, the amount of money is gargantuan. And it just, it will keep going for sure. Um, but at some point, I mean, the, the way I like to think about it is the, this concept of the Laffer curve, which is, you know, something the, the Reagan economists like in the 80s, the view is like, well, you know, if you keep, if you raise taxes, initially it raises revenues for the government. But then if you have a 100% tax rate, obviously nobody works. Uh, so revenue is to zero. So at some point, there must be some sort of an infection point. Um, same thing is true with passive. A little bit of passive in the way that John Bogle thought about it, maybe 10, 20%. Yes, markets are still going to work. Price discovery is still going to happen. The passive sector is still going to be uh, f- um, free riding the work of active investors. But when passive becomes dominant, you know, instead of the, if you can feel the dog wagging the tail, it's more the tail wagging the dog. Right. Um, and if you get theoretically that 100% passive stock market, which we may get, at this point, nothing could happen, right? Because uh, uh, everybody would be an index fund, you couldn't raise capital, they would, you know, um, no one would trade with each other even. Uh, so you'd get to a, a point where the market would stop working. Um, so where is that infection point? Is it is it 30% passive, 40, 50, 70? We're going to find out. I would argue that we are already seeing signs that um, again, the, the, the tail is wagging the dog. Passive. Let's wait for that. Let, let's wait for that. Let's wait for that. Because I, pro- I promise it's coming. I promise it's coming. But I want you to back up and explain, if you wouldn't mind, um, the automation effect of, of, of the 401k, how it's become, in your words, a whale. Uh, so, and you just mentioned a Department of Labor ruling mm-hmm. that has made something that was already automated even more automated but but if you can go back and explain how it's a whale and why we don't periodically witness statistical miracles perfect so yes yeah, so uh it's a 2000 2015 uh department of labor guidance on something called qualified default investment alternative and, and i think the the issue that we're trying to solve to their credit, I, I don't think there was nefarious intents there, uh, is the fact that a lot of people, even if they do have a 401k and they, they're contributing, the employer is, uh, is contributing, they're just not investing the money because they don't have the knowledge, it's stressful, um, you know, they don't know what to buy, there are too many options. So uh, the Department of Labor said, well, we're going to put them by default uh, into something that we think is good for you. And that thing that they think is good for them is the lowest cost option, which means an index fund. And then, you know, because you need to match the investment profile uh, of a strategy with the uh, the age and, and risk tolerance, 
uh, we're going to put you a target date fund. So a target date fund is a automatically self rebalancing uh, strategy where, you know, as you're young, you're going to be maybe 90% equities, 10% bonds. And then as you age, your glide path is going to reduce the amount of equities in your fund, increase the amount of bonds and cash so that you have more liquidity, less risk as you get older. Mm-hmm. All that is done automatically. It's completely on autopilot. So the, uh, the, uh, the, the money is invested in index funds. Uh, the largest one of them are, are the one produced, um, issued by Vanguard. I think there's a, the, the total market, total stock market fund index has more than a trillion in asset, a trillion with a T. I mean, this is, so this is why I call the whale, right? I mean, this is, this is just, um, I mean, if one that fund. balance, I mean, it's going to move the market, of course. Uh, most of the Vanguard target date fund have only three holdings, uh, total market US, uh, total market international, uh, stock, and then, um, the total, total bond market index. Uh, and, and then the only decision that happens is, of course, invest the money, right? So every month they get the checks from the 401k and gets rolled over. Uh, and so that also creates some, um, seasonality, right? Based on, on how, when people are paid. Uh, and then the other, the, the other decision is they need to keep the, um, the relative weights of their assets in check at all time. So let's say the strategy is going to be 70% stock, 30% bonds. So when the stock market goes up, uh, you're going to, if you do nothing, you're going to be maybe 80, 20. So you have to buy the underperforming assets. So at the end of the quarter, you rebalance. And uh, you can actually start seeing that in prices. I mean, one thing that uh, my friend Mike Green and I noticed is the, the patterns of, of recent market bottoms on the S&P 500. I mean, after COVID, the bottom was March 23, the third Friday of the last day of the quarter. Uh, after the, the Powell bear market, um, you know, the Christmas massacre, right? So it was on December 24, I think, because the, the Friday fell on a, um, the 20, um, there was a holiday, but basically it was the same, the third right. Friday of the fourth month. And when we had the, the Volmageddon in, in 2018, uh, again, mm-hmm. it was on the 23rd, on the third Friday of the month. So you have three market bottoms basically on the same date. And you got, what is the statistical probability that this happens? The more likely explanation is that in both cases, stocks were down 20% or more, uh, and most of these target date funds were massively underweight stocks because they had to go back, right? So if you were at 80, 80, 20, and the stocks have dropped by like almost 30% during COVID, you know, your allocation looked more like, um, you know, a, a 60, 40 by then. So you had to f- and, and think about a trillion dollar fund, right? That whale. I mean, so it has to go back, increase by 20, just on that form, you get a 200 billion inflow, inflow. into the market. And of course, that's going to, that's going to lift everything up. I mean, there's no, nobody can just has like $200 billion to sell at any point in time. Yeah. Until, until you and Mike taught me about this, I really did think it was just Jay Powell, but, but he just had really good timing. But the one that was interesting was the Powell pivot wasn't until January 4th of 2019. And yet, to your point, the stock market had already started to recover before Powell made that speech. And to me, that the, that is the one that is the most indicative of the power of this rebalancing and how it manifested in the markets before he got up on stage and said, I apologize for my younger days and saying QE was bad. Um, let, let's shift gears for a little bit. Um, you recently wrote something that I found to be kind of blasphemous. I said, wow, wow, he, he put that in writing. Um, you said ESG is a fairy tale. Uh, I mean, there's probably a lot of people, there may be some people who just turned this interview off. Bye. Thank you. See you. Um, explain, explain what that means. Environmental, social, and governance. Uh, more than 3,000 signatories to the United Nations principles for investment manage more than $100 trillion. This, we're not talking about, you know, pennies here. Yes, no, it, 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 it's, uh, it's, it's huge and it's going very fast. There's a, on average this year, uh, two and a half new ESG ETFs have been launched every day. Every day? Every day, yes. Um, which really makes you wonder, you know, how, how many, how many do we need? I mean, if we keep going at this pace, very soon we'll have more ESG funds and we have stocks to, to select from. Um, and, uh, no, I'm, listen, I, 
I have nothing but good 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 feelings toward the SG movement. I mean, it was born in the in the early nineties. People wanted to use the power of their dollars in order to create change and invest in, in virtuous companies and and try to develop their own uh, their own rating and and basically an, an alternative. Um, an alternative way of investing that's not based purely on profitability, but also on environmental and social impact. So there's nothing wrong with that idea. Uh, the fairy tale to me comes when we tell people that um, they will also beat the market, uh, which is something that um, Larry Fink and obviously BlackRock benefits a lot. I mean, BlackRock has been at the, the forefront of um, a lot of these yep. ESG launches. And, and and now we have this fairy tale where it's like, oh, uh, do well by doing good. Not only by uh, investing in these companies, you will, you know, help solve climate change. Which, I mean, that should be another conversation whether ESG actually accomplish its, its objective or, you know, my, my view is. I mean, it's not very clear to me how giving more money to Microsoft helps solve climate change. But um, um, nonetheless, even let's take that on face value that you know you are you know affecting the world in a positive way. And also, you will achieve superior results, and, and that claim really is based on on the the, the rally that we saw in ESG funds have actually beaten the market in 2020. Uh, and in large part, I would say it's purely coincidental. It's because ESG funds tend to be overweight big tech because big tech has very little environmental impact and lower social issues because they're, well, there are fewer employees and they're well paid, right? So I mean, it's it's easier to you know have good relation with your workers if you're, you know, uh, Microsoft and if you're Walmart. So they were just, they just happened to be at the right place at the right time. But then that led to all these claims that, oh, if you just keep buying ESG funds, you will keep beating the market, which is actually the exact opposite of how it should work, even philosophically. I mean, let's remember that the idea with ESG is, you know, you're going to pay more to invest in virtuous companies, and then you're going to exclude sinful companies portfolio. So your return should go down. And that's the entire idea. You're going to change capital allocation at a cost of the investor base in order to affect positive change. That is the right pitch. Uh, but by telling people that they can have their cake and have it, we're really just telling them a fairy tale. And, and really the only people who benefit from this are the people selling uh, ESG fund or ESG index, which I would say, say now has become kind of the goal of the ESG industry. It's just a, a mechanism to create fees. Well, so, and, and, and plus, I mean, ESG is one of the first kind of investing philosophies that has been born into a world in which passive was dominant. And so um, you say that relying on passive fund managers, index providers, and proxy managers to make capitalism um, more, uh, a, to, to make it, capitalism a moral gain is like having an arsonist run the fire department. I mean, can you explain that that very uh, pointed, shall yes, we say? Yes. Point, pointed. So I, I think I think that the concept of passive ESG is an oxymoron. Uh, it's a contradiction in terms. Um, so again, let's go back to ESG the way it was designed by you know the the the, the in the early nineties by people who really had um, you know goals to to impact change. The idea was inherently active is I'm going to select the virtuous companies. Um, I'm going to go through, you know, their financial statement. I'm going to analyze them. And also I will engage with them in order to to um, to make them behave better. I mean, you can think of um, engine number one and Exxon, like some of these guys, activists that make sure that they do what, 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 what we expected, uh, what we expect them to do uh, and punish them what we uh, punish when they don't do it. Um, tell the media about bad practices and, and so forth. It's an inherently active game. Now, however, this has been hijacked by uh, big uh, ETF providers um, and index funds, which is like, well, no, no, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to come up with a list every quarter, whatever, um, according to a methodology that is very hard to audit, that is uh, very subjective in many ways, that leaves many issues out of the table, including the issues of whether companies pay taxes or not, for example, which to me is, is a big one. Uh, when you care about the world, uh, you know, paying your taxes is kind of your first duty as a as a as a corporate citizen. Right. So we, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do that. We're gonna package it, and then all you have to do 
uh, is by is by my ETF, and and it will give you like a, a little badge of honor, like you know when when the teacher gives the kids like a little star, like, oh, you, you know, a little participation trophy. No, you're like a, you're like an ESG investor. Thank you for making the world a better place. I mean, a, again, these are people, and I'm I'm not saying this as as negative. I'm just pointing out a, con, a contradiction in terms. Uh, the way the big, you know, the Vanguard, the BlackRock, the State Street rose to where they are is by automating and getting rid of the active element of investing by, you know, having no research, uh, reducing trading, not engaging with companies, just blindly following an index. So the notion that somehow the same three companies will be able to reorient capitalism in an ethical way, it's probably the hardest task at hand, right? I mean, you have to define the goals you want to achieve. You have to think of how you're going to achieve them. Uh, you have to select the companies. You have to engage the company. The view that we can just do that with these magical lists, which, by the way, comes from a very oligo oligopolistic industry. I mean, you basically right. have index providers, uh, Stan, uh, Dow Jones, and S&P, and then Moody's, uh, sorry, MSCI, uh, who basically have gobbled everybody around them, and they are run, I mean, they're private corporation. They are run for the, the benefits. They have a fiduciary duty to shareholder to maximize profit. These are, these companies do not have the responsibility to solve climate change or address the gender gap or close the racial gap in America. I mean, they are here to create ind indices. With these indices goes money, and they get a little cut on that, and the more money they get, the richer they get. That is what they should be doing. Expecting that this is somehow going to change the world is delusional in my opinion. So let me just get this straight. You've got an oligopoly of, of platforms. Right. You've got an oligopoly of index providers. Mm -hmm. And they're feeding an oligopoly that is mostly based in Silicon Valley. Right. That are already yeah. the largest players in the other index funds. Correct. So you got yeah. an oligopoly that sees an oligopoly. Great. Okay, this is very American. Yes. And also, I think, raises an important question uh, is, you know, what do we think is the more severe threat facing, you know, the more severe dysfunction of capitalism today? Uh, and I'm not minimizing the issues of environment and, and, and the social justice. I, I think they are here. I, I'm not a denier of stuff. Or is it the excessive concentration of industry in a few hands? I don't know which one is the more important, but I think that the concentration problem is, is quite serious. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I am certain that the ESG movement is making that a lot worse. I mean, again, if you look at the top holdings of most ESG ETFs, first of all, it's virtually indis indistinguishable from basic index form. And the reason it is that way is the, the closet indexing argument, right? No one wants to underperform. So that, you know, if you want to run a successful like these strategies, you, you know, you, you track, secretly track the index. You do all this stuff, but at the end of the day, you end up with the same portfolio. The only difference is even more skewed towards big tech. So the biggest holdings are going to be Microsoft is always the whole time favorite. Apple is very big there. Um, Facebook, some, some companies view it as ESG, some don't. Uh, Amazon, same thing, a little, a little worse. But in general, there's a big overweight in big tech and, and, and big pharma. And I mean, just ask yourself, like in 2021 America, it, it, do we need more money to go to big tech and big pharma? Like, is this, is this solving the, the world's problem? Like, um, is it, you know, by throwing an extra trillion at, at the FANG, how, how is this making the world a better place? Well, it's not if you go down any street in San Francisco or New York and you see all the small businesses that are no longer with us and the soul of the country. But that's a different subject. Um, so you, uh, one of the subjects that you touch on uh, is the role of systemic strategies in influencing market outcomes. Uh, one area of focus that you've highlighted is, and this is going to be in editing for God knows how long, weeks and weeks, maybe months and months, who knows. But today, as we're talking... Um, you, you've highlighted option, the option expiry, which happens to be today. Uh, how do you think these influence, uh, these, these events, if you will, influence the markets? Um, well, we've seen it. Uh, theoretically, it should not, right? I mean, theoretically, we should have this kind of perfectly efficient market where, you know, uh, demand and supply, like, balance each other and yada yada. But, I mean, clearly, we've seen it's not the case. I mean, I... I gave the example of the, the, the market bottoming four times on the same date. 
so there's a, the target date from channel, which is what we discussed, and the rebalancing, like buying buying the asset that goes down at the end of the quarter. And then you have the, the option channel, which is slightly different, but certainly we've seen a lot of that, which um, as a result of this kind of um, the, the stimulus and the popularization of apps like Robinhood, uh, the, the rise of uh, Reddit uh, and, and uh, uh, retail investors kind of getting together, which, which is all great, by the way, and I'm, I'm very in favor of it. But part of the part of the issue with with the with this rise of um, retail traders is that they they tend to they have a lot of money. Uh, and they tend to buy very leveraged instruments, uh, short-term call options on the names they like. So it's the meme stock, it's the Tesla, it's the yada yada. And that, that's just a, sort, a new source of flow that was not there before. Now, the people who sell these options to them, uh, which has uh, market maker and, and, and market makers and broker dealers, need to hedge, right? Because if you sell an option, obviously, you, you know, if you sell if you sell a call, uh, you know, if, if the stock goes up, well, you, you're going to be on the hook for, to find the stock, right? So. That creates a problem for them because they have all this hedging flow that they need to uh, um, to maintain at all time to, to keep their the, the, the risk uh, the, the, the risk budget on, on track, uh, and, and that means that yes, yeah, sometimes you get these squeezes, uh, completely irrational uh, spikes in prices that have nothing to do with fundamental but everything to do with positioning mm-hmm. and can be gamed. I mean, that was the whole idea between GameStop. And, you know, I'm, I'm not, again, I'm not made even this. I, I say, you know, God bless them. I mean, it's a game and, and you play by the rules of the game. And then sometimes it's good that the little guy wins the game against the big guys. There's a, a David versus Goliath aspect to this that's quite pleasant to watch if you're not on the wrong side of it. Uh, <laughs> but yes. it contributes to making the market less and less about fundamentals and more and more about flows, demand and positioning. And over time, if you think that, as I kind of do, that the role of, of capital markets is capital allocation, and that is actually very important. Price discovery, this is what ultimately makes the economy work. This is one of the reasons why the Soviet economy collapsed. It's not because their planets were not smart enough, it's because they had a centralized system uh, where information could not, I mean, that's what price is. Price is an inf- a, a signal. Every, every price means some, should mean something about reality. If price means nothing about reality, it just means, oh, we have this gamma squeeze and we need to cover and the stock goes up by a thousand percent, then the entire system, I think, over time becomes inefficient and, and risk collapsing. Well, it's, it's good that the Fed is the Federal Reserve is not very Soviet-esque and that they've really preserved price discovery. I'm being really sarcastic because Fed policy has, I think, amplified, if you will, uh, indexing, amplified the push to passive because people know that they only have to be exposed to the market. They don't even know, need to know what they're in because they know that the Fed's got their back. So monetary policy has just been, just it, it's like throwing gasoline on the fire. Correct, correct. Uh, 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 and and this, these two phenomena feed of each other. And you have this debate on Twitter, and a lot of people are like, oh, I guess, you know, no, it's, it's the Fed stupid, and you know, it's QE, money printer goes wrong, yada, I, that yada. That was my weekly, I just wrote that, it's the Fed stupid, anyways, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, to me, it, 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 it is both. Like, it is the the, the situation, the, the the bubble situation that we have today is a product of this uh, feedback loop mm-hmm. uh, between easy monetary policy, uh, price insensitive buying by many central banks, not just, not just the Fed but abroad as well, and um, the rise of the rise of passive that contributes to creating this mentality that yes, the name of the game is just just want to get exposure, right? And, and since, since stock prices only go up because the Fed is going to bail out the market every time there's a correction, uh, really, you know, all you have to do is just, you know, uh, buy an index fund and, 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 and not worry about anything else. And again, I mean, if we think that the Fed's mandate, you know, also includes financial stability, which I think it should, uh, you know, uh, over time, I think that there's a contradiction between what seems to be the objective of constantly rising stock prices, which um, certainly is what we've achieved, uh, and financial stability over the long term. So, um, you know, obviously 2017 marked uh, peak global quantitative easing. So, I I mean global. I I think I always like to say QE is global and fungible. It doesn't matter where the liquidity is coming from. It just matters that the liquidity is flowing. And 2017 marked that peak. 
without retail investors, by the way, no retail participation. And then we turn the corner to 2018 and the liquidity starts to come off. So how do you feel, uh, again, given the fact that the, the target date funds are a force in and of themselves, regardless of the Fed beginning to taper, but, but how do you factor into your thinking the fact that the liquidity is going to slowly come off in terms of the flows into the market on the part of the Fed, if they stick with it, who knows? Right. Um, I, I'm a little bit worried uh, about 2022 uh, because we have several possible squeezes on, on market liquidity. So one of them is you mentioned the, 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 the taper. Uh, where you know we're going to go from 120 billion a month to zero in in, in six months. Um, now that could be offset uh, to some extent by by QE abroad. I, I don't think the European Central Bank is going to stop. Uh, maybe actually increase. Uh, but in general, I mean the Fed again. And we're talking like reducing the pace of acceleration. I mean, of course, just, yes. Again, but, but, but at, that, at, at, at the margin, at the margin, yes. de deltas always matter. So. Yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's kind of a secondary argument. I mean, they, they're still buying just less fast and also they're reinvesting. So yes. it's not uh, the actual taper yes. we had after 2015 when the balance sheet actually shrank. I mean, no, no one's talking about that yeah. yet, which no. is increasing at a slower pace. But yes, uh, the market has been used, if you will, of getting 120 billion and that's, that number is going to go down. Um, uh, the, the other uh, source of liquidity that I think is uh, going away is coming from the Treasury General Account. So when, when, when the U.S. government uh, uh, raises cash uh, for, for various spending you can't, programs, you can't spend it right away, right? I mean, it's hard to spend, you know, two, three, right. even for, for DC politician, you can't spend two trillion a day, right? So you park that money uh, so that the U.S. government is basically a checking account the Fed, right. uh, the treasury account, and you park that money, and then that money can be lent uh, via the repo market, so that creates a lot of liquidity. So that TGA was very full uh, because we had so much insurance uh, in 2020 and not much spending. And then the government can kind of join that down over time. So that means it's going to have to replenish it. How do you replenish it? What do you issue your debt? Uh, so you you know, you know give basically a piece of paper for people's money. So that sucks money out of the system. And then you have to put it back on, on the cash account. So that sucks money out of the system. That could happen at the same time as the Fed is tightening. Mm -hmm. And there is an aspect, I think there's a squeeze that comes from, from high commodity prices. Uh, remember that commodities need to be financed, right? I mean, if you um, if you're an oil importer, well, you need to buy that in advance. You need to book the ship. Uh, you need to pay the producer in advance. The producer needs to have his production. So all of that demand is a function of the, the price of oil. So if oil is at you know twenty bucks or minus forty the way it was, that cost the cost of like financing you know two months of oil production is very low. At eighty bucks, it's a lot higher, and it's not just oil, it's copper, yada yada. So you see more money being tied into commodities, which is something that you sometimes see the Fed say that, uh, but they really explain is that there is a tightening aspect that comes from higher commodity prices. It's like a natural tightening because more, uh, you know, uh, commodities suck liquidity away. So you have these three forces that could suck liquidity away in the next six months. Um, is it going to be enough? I thought, I mean, I will admit to a mistake. Well, Bartle, I thought we'd have a correction this quarter, was my guess. I mean, we had a little bit of, of weakness for a couple of days in September, but again, by today's standard, you know, 3% is, is a bear market. Uh, yeah. And then right back up because you have all, all these other sources of liquidity against that. Uh, one is this target date from channel, which is very, very important. Again, think of every American spending 5 to 10% of the paycheck, just getting invested in the market again and again. And incomes are up by 20% year over year. I mean, it's insane. I mean, um, household wealth has increased by 31 trillion with a T, trillion with a T since the COVID low. I mean, this is, we made three times more money in the post-COVID recovery as we had lost during the great financial crisis. Yep. So it's, it's free great financial crisis just going the other way. 700% of GDP, in, you know, the, when, when you compare it to, dis, to disposable income, it's just, the numbers are insane. But go back for a minute to commodities, if you don't mind. Um, so uh, how do you think what is happening right now? We're disaggregating the supply chain. And we're doing it kind of by force because some, some companies feel that they can never be in that position again of the just in time and being you know, caught out. Uh, but, but talk about disaggregating the supply chain 
and and not just reopening in the effect that that has on the flows, but also the potential, as we've heard, starting to come out of Europe of of fresh shutdowns. And 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 again, just explain one more time how that influences not just monetary but fiscal policy. Right. Um, so I think what happened to the supply chain is a. Uh, almost a giant whack uh, to the global economy, which was this, you know, really carefully optimized system that works beautifully, right? It's miraculous, right? You, you order something on Amazon Prime and your phone arrives in two hours. I mean, wow. If you think about, if you think about what goes into this, end, you know, just, I, I was wondering, wow. Like the, the amount of like, where does this come from? Who put the, I mean, it's stunning and I can get it anytime I want and it's all working seamlessly well, but it is an extremely fragile system. Uh, and, and, and COVID was a giant, giant, uh, hit to the, to that system. And some people had to stop working, uh, entire provinces in China were locked down and then also consumption's pattern shifted, right? I mean, there's things you couldn't spend money on uh, movie theaters, uh, uh, going out restaurants, yada, yada. So the, some of that spending moved to other things which, you know, created added demand uh, for some of these things. And there was not the capacity to, to supply them was no longer there. Uh, so, you know, you started to see that in, you know, odd things like the price of lumber and then it became uh, uh, used cars because of memory chips. And uh, uh, now you have a squeeze on, on, on many commodities. So, again, this is all kind of this unraveling of, of the global supply chain. Uh, and some of these issues, I don't, I don't really see them go away that quickly, especially as we are considering new ways of lockdown in, in Europe, uh, as we still have a, a zero COVID policy in China. Uh, the issues of the ports uh, in the U.S. Is, is very serious. It's not getting addressed. Uh, truckers is another one. I think half of truckers are going to retire in the next five years. I mean, who's going to replace them? Um, so I, th- I think for a long time, we've completely underinvested in, in supply chain and building resilience in the system. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, because it was never a problem, right? You could always order more from China and, and we never had to think about it. And we have to catch up, you know, the policies of, of 20 years in, in, in six months while, you know, much of the economy is still not working. And at the same time, we have this insane wealth effect and stimulus that's boosting demand. So uh, it's like trying to take down a fire while pouring gasoline on it at the same time. Yep. Well, so so you mentioned China. Um, how... how do- how do you interpret kind of how very bold they've become on the world stage and in inside inside of their own country? I mean, I mean, now China is the wealthiest nation on the planet, which is kind of hard to believe. But there's more wealth in China than there is in any other country. Uh, and then there's the element of Xi Jinping and whether or not he is as as invincible as he appears to be, whether there, I mean, I hear some friends say there's, there, there could be enemies within. And then finally, what, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on Taiwan? So lot, lots to unpack there. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I think that was the plan all along from the start. Um, you know, basically, so after the, the end of the Mao era, we have the Cultural Revolution, the Gang of Four, the economy is in, in complete shackle, uh, you know, you have mass starvation. Uh, and this is when, when China kind of walks back from, from the policies of Maoism with Deng Xiaoping, start the special economic zones, starts opening up. And, and, and Deng Xiaoping's idea is that well, well, China is very weak right now, so we're going to keep a low profile. Uh, but the idea was, you know, build a low profile so it can gain strength, right? It's, it's you know, like playing Go. I mean, you assess your position. If your position of weakness, you know, you have to play humbly. Uh, and, and, you know, that's what China did under, under Deng and the, uh, the Yang Zemin and the Hu Jin. And, and progressively, as China became more prosperous and prosperous, you saw them become increasingly uh, nationalistic and saying, hey, well, you know, maybe I should matter, right? So is the national evolution a thing? Uh, I think in, in Xi Jinping's mind, and, and really pretty much, I mean, and everyone I spoke with in China is that, that 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 is not just a CCP thing. I mean, they kind of view you know China as a natural leader of the world. You know, it's the Middle Kingdom. It's you know between heaven and earth. Everybody around is a barbarian. Every other king has to pay tribute to the emperor of China, the the the, the, the son of heaven. And and we're just going back there. We're just undoing these these historical anomalies when the barbarians were able to you know bomb out bomb the ports. 
Uh, and now, now is the time to, to flex the muscles. So Xi Jinping has been the guy who flexed the muscles first with the Belt and Road Initiative, and you know, then with more aggressive behavior towards his neighbor. Uh, but I, I think that was the power alone. And in a way, I mean, this, this is how great powers behave. I mean, there was nothing uh, gentle about the rise of the United States. Uh, the United States was also involved in, 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 in piracy and stealing intellectual property from the UK. Uh, ask about Latin Americans, ask about the Mexicans, how they felt about the rise of the United States, the Spaniards during the, 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 the Cuban wars. I mean, mm-hmm. a, a, a nation that rises will, you know, try to impose its will by force. Uh, in the case of China, of course, it's because the, the country is so big and so centralized. <laughs> It's a big shock to the economy and, in a way, a much riskier one um, in, in terms of its uh, conflict, possible conflict with, with the U.S. and the fact that, you know, China has all the disputes with pretty much every country around it, whether it's India and the Himalaya, uh, Taiwan, the Spartan Islands. Uh, while with Russia, they cannot solve it. Uh, the hostility with Japan is still there. So, um, yes, it's, it, it is probably the biggest geopolitical challenge of our time. Interesting. Um, let, let's uh, let, let's go back uh, to the well. And, and, and here's my here's my other question about China. Um, China's just come through an episode in uh, call it their their junk bond sector, concentrated in the property area. Will will Chinese markets uh, be isolated and insulated from the global financial system? Is that going to remain the case going forward? Because it certainly was, I think, surprising. It wasn't surprising to me because I've got friends in China who are like, it's going to be contained, uh, you know, by gunpoint. But, uh, but do you think that the global, because there's a, there, 2021 is, 2020 and 2021, there's going to be more foreign direct investment into China than there is into the United States. The numbers are just what they are. So companies continue to put money into China. <laughs> And yet, so, so I, do you think their financial system ever weaves its way into the global financial system? I mean, eventually, I think that's, that's their goal, but they're very, uh, very cautious about it. I mean, they saw what happened to uh, East Asia in, 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 in the 90s, mm-hmm. uh, opened up the capital account. They had all these, you know, flows of hot money. And then in 1998, then, you know, currencies got destroyed. The IMF had to walk in. So I think that's kind of the... The nightmare scenario for China is, is to is to open too quickly, you know. And also, generally, there, you know, bureaucrats are going to be bureaucrats, right? They they want to keep control. Uh, so, especially you know, when you're a Marxist bureaucrat, uh, yep. is your reason to, to to remain. So, to answer your question, the capital account in China is still not really open; it's still actually mostly closed. Uh, so that's I think that's the reason why you don't see contagion uh, is because uh, money can move freely in and out of China. Uh, and also another peculiarity of China is this extremely high savings rate and, and financial regression. Mm-hmm. I mean, consumption as a share of Chinese GDP is probably around 40%, mm-hmm. close to 75, 80% in the US, right? So what does that mean? I mean, there's 60% of household income that flows through the banking sector or the real estate sector or whatever, but it's not being consumed, cannot move away freely, right? It's kind of hard for, um, you know, Chinese, uh, people to own assets abroad. So that creates this uh, huge part of money with which you can restructure the banking sector uh, very easily without the intervention of foreigners or, or the IMF. And I think that was always the plan, right? I think it's, again, uh, the Chinese uh, leaders, leadership has been very uh, cautious of what happened in 1998, 1999 East Asia and wants to avoid that. So they want to be able to have their own bubbles and then clean the mess themselves. And again, as long as the uh, the people who own the assets and the liability, all of them in the same currency and the same country, mm-hmm. it's a matter of transfer. You know, okay, who's going to get the hit on this Evergrande bond, right? I mean, is it going to be the, the, the banks, the wealth management product, the retail investors, yada, yada, but it's something that can be managed internally. And I think that's that's been the pattern so far. Um, and I don't see it uh, coming to uh, kind of a global contagion at this point. Uh, I, I I, I hear your point on, um, yes, more money is flowing into China. I mean, large wars at the, at the bequest of, of large investment 
firms in the U.S. like mm-hmm. the, the BlackRock, the Goldman Sachs, which is giant market, yep. you know, this extraordinarily high saving. I mean, this is the wealthiest country on earth with a sixty percent savings rate. I mean, if you're an investment manager, you, you, the, yeah, There's, you know, you yeah. can see the the big pile of money you just want in trillions uh, and trillions and trillions of dollars. Yes. Yes. Um, so speaking of trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars, uh, let, let's let's go. Let, let's come back to the United States and the tail wagging the dog. So. Um, you, you have said in the past that there is such a thing as peak passive. And more recently, you, you flagged six different indicators that suggest to you that, that something is bubbling under the surface, that there is tension rising in, in passive investing valuations or structurally higher. Um, when, when corrections do occur, they're less, they're less frequent. They're, they're not as deep. The recoveries come faster. The largest index capitalization stocks keep getting bigger. Um, prices are clearly divorced from fundamentals. They're also completely disconnected from economics and economic data. I mean, we've seen, we've seen, you know, cars sales go from 18 million a month seasonally adjusted annualized rate to 13, and and the and the consumer discretionary sector has gone haywire in in the face of this. So. Um, and, and also CEOs pay and stock-based compensation. So, so these are some things that you're looking at, and, and what do they tell you? Well, to me, you know, the, the concept of the proponents of evidence, right, this is kind of how you would use in a, in a criminal jury. Uh, none of these things are the smoking gun. I mean, for each of the, the six forces that you outline here, you can find out other explanation. Monetary policy would be one of them. Uh, for a lot of these things, uh, or globalization. Uh, but then, again, there's a common thread with all of this, is that they could all be the result of, of the passive hypothesis. So again, you know, it's not a smoking gun. Like, we haven't found the, the dead corpse and the, 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 the guy with the, you know, the, the, hand, the, bloody, the bloody hand in the, uh, the, the bloody knife in the hand, but they, there's a preponderance of it. So let, let me just walk through uh, the, the, the list. So valuations are structurally high and constantly rising. So until uh, until SPY was launched in 1993, if you look at a long-term chart of, of the, the P ratio of the S&P 500, uh, Sheila has done that. You can download that on his yep. uh, Yale website. And you just see like something that just goes up and down, you know, mm-hmm. up in the growing 20s, down the depression, and, you know, back up all the way up in the 70s. And, and it's a perfectly mean series. Which kind of makes sense, right? It's like, well, you know, the uh, uh, you know, sometimes people get overly optimistic; they overpay for assets and they drop. And you know, this pattern broke in 1993, which happens to be the year you know SPY, the first ETF, was launched, and of course accelerated in the past. Really, since 2016, when we've seen this inflection, and really, I think 2016 to me is, you know, the, the way people say about bankruptcy, how it happened first fully, then um, I mean, what I think first fully, then all at once. I think that was kind of the all at once moment, right? So. That's the first one. Uh, corrections are rarer and recoveries are faster. Uh, again, look, look at the patterns in terms of the, 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 the corrections. So OA tried to keep, you know, a 50% drop. You know, market didn't make a new high, I think it's 2013. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the vol market, you know, was very short. The Powell, uh, the Powell bear market, uh, you know, December, as soon as Powell came out and said, okay, it's over, it was over. Uh, and then even COVID, which to me had the potential of being like a secular air market when you think about the impact. I mean, mm-hmm. boom, the month it was gone. Um, stock prices is connected from companies for now. I think this one's so obvious, I don't need to address it. Yep. You, you already mentioned some, some ideas, but you look at the performance of companies, no profit, even no sales. I mean, you see companies, no sales, part of like 200 billion market cap. Wow. This is insane. Um, uh, the largest stock outperform, I think, is another good, uh, good, interesting example. So, one of the most established anomaly in, in stock market is, you know, you could beat the you could beat the index just by not investing in the largest stock. Uh, for 70, 80 years, that always worked, and and that's because you know it's hard to be the top dog, right? I mean, you're the top dog, everybody's shooting for you. You have these economies of scale. You become complacent, and you can think about IBM, you can think about Exxon Mobil, mm-hmm. think about General Electric, yep. all the you know once great companies that have fallen, um, and the exact opposite. Is happening today, right? The the ones that do the best are Apple and Microsoft, and they just keep getting bigger and bigger. And uh, and I think some of that is coming from this demand from passive funds. Uh, the bigger they get, the more they must be bought. 
uh, regardless of, of the multiples. I mean, you look at, you know, the, the multiple of, on Microsoft, I mean, it's like, how big are they going to be? Need, do they need to be in order to justify this going forward? Well, it doesn't matter because it's not about the future earnings of Microsoft. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's more money going into passive vehicles. Um, and then yeah, the last one that we mentioned is, is CEO pay and survey compensation. I, I think that's that's one that's that's forgotten and that's almost conspirational out here. But passive is very nice if you're a CEO, you know? I mean, because shareholders are a pain in the butt. Uh, you know, you have to report your board and you have to like you know, do the things you don't want to do. But if it's just an index fund that just, you know, either doesn't vote or if they vote, it's just like for the proxy advice, which is, you know, I mean, the, the, the proxy, that's another segment of the industry that's completely ridiculous. Well, that means you kind of have a free hand. I mean, a passive investor, that's the dream. Like if you're a, you know, a startup, like, you know, a founders, oh my God, my VC wants this or that. Oh, no, he's just going to give me the money. Let me do what I want. Oh, well, I'm, you know, yeah, maybe I'm going to get that private jet. Yeah, I've worked hard. Maybe I'm going to get that, you know, that multi-million dollar package because no one's going to tell me anything. And you've seen that certainly at big tech firms where, you know, CEO pay at mostly stock bases increase and also the amount of, of money that they pay to their employees in stock because they know that there is this captive demand for, for their shares, right? They know that the money is flowing into these passive vehicles every month. They know that because of the larger stock in the index, they must be bought. So they can issue in some, some, some big tech companies issue about 10% of their float every year in stock-based compensation. In a normal world, they would have to pay cash. Now, cash is annoying because you can't print cash or you go to jail. But you can print, you can print your shares and, 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 you know, and if people can sell it, you've effectively discovered the printing press. And yet the same exact companies that you've just mentioned are also the, the biggest dinosaurs, the hugest beasts inside of the share buyback machine. At the same yes, time. No, they kind of need to, right? I mean, because otherwise people would notice. Like, you know, if, if, if you're Facebook, it's like you issue so many, many shares, you, you know, your flow is going to grow. So what you're going to do because your business is so profitable because you are a monopoly, uh, well, you use some of that, you do a buyback. But effectively, that's, that's really taking money from shareholders to give it to insider in a very convoluted way with a tax advantage. Well, you can, you can borrow debt to do it. I mean. Yes. And I mean, I don't think this is an outcome that's socially optimal in any way. I mean, it, it does not serve the benefit of society at large because you lose on the tax basis. Uh, you make society more unequal. Uh, and also, you, I would argue you report the shareholders. I mean, because, um, you know, instead of, uh, um, you know, your, your the share count remains the same, but the cash balance keeps going down because you constantly need to uh, buy back your shares to offset yep. the shares that you're giving yourself. So it's pretty much the same thing as we, I mean, if you think about it, it's the same thing as taking money at the end of the day from the cash account and giving it to yourself. Just use that convoluted loop uh, to make it okay. Well, on that happy note, um, I've, I've got a few last, uh, last burning questions. So I, I kind of, I, I understood the English, I understood the French, and I understood the Italian. Um, I'm sorry, but why do you speak Indonesian? Uh, I don't think I could have a conversation at this point uh, uh, anymore. Oh, but darn. I, okay. Cool. I couldn't either. That's the good news. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No one can call me on this one. No, but back in France, when I, when I was studying, uh, it's a concours de cadres d'Orient. If you wanted to work for the minister, uh, the, the foreign affairs ministry, you had to speak a, uh, a weird language, an East Oriental, that's what they call it, an Oriental language. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I did in Singapore, which is very close to Indonesia, and Indonesia has a peculiarity of being this, the simplest Indonesian is, is the simplest language in the world, right? They had all these these mm, thousands of islands who spoke different languages. So they standardized everything, and they came up with this language that is extremely simple. And even if you're not, you know, you can learn it in a couple of months uh, and, and, and get by with. So that that was back when I thought I was going to work for the uh, in the French public service. Uh, I already always wanted to kind of you know live abroad, and I thought that was the the fastest way to achieve that and it's it's a fun language it's a beautiful country um and um generally i think it's you know a learning language is really helps see the world in a different way well and, um and thank you i, I was just it, it was just a moment of, of, of curiosity on my part i was like, that 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 how does that fit with that um so obviously you you uh you're an in i call him in the weeds kind of a guy i mean you're 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 formulaic you think in 
in calculus. And, um, and, and so you actually get together occasionally and, and go on hikes with a few people kind of like you, like, like, like Brent Johnson and, and Mike Green and Alex Garovich. Uh, I'm curious to know, when, when you guys are hiking, uh, what are you talking about? And, and by the way, wait, wait, why is Mike Green always tweeting out these weird pictures of food? And what's this keto thing? So I'm, I'm just, I got to know, what, what, what are you guys talking about hiking up the, the hill? Um, Mike talks a lot about his keto diet. Uh, no, I mean. Uh, <laughs> he does tweet a lot about it. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, actually, I think it was, Mike, I think, came up with the idea, got, got a bunch of uh, kind of investors or economists or global macro or hedge fund managers in the case of, of Alex together and say, well, let, let's, let's meet, let, let's talk about, you know, the economy, where we see things going, but let's do that in a uh, kind of friendly setting. And, and at the time, you know, he, he wanted to be back in shape, which, you know, I think why he went the hike. And I don't know if you've been to Marin, but you get some pretty good hills there. I mean, it's, it's stunning. It's, it's so beautiful. I mean, I've lived here for 12 years and still I cannot believe my eyes when, when I want to climb up Park Hill or whatever and see that it's, it's really wonderful. So there, there's a, you know, let, let's let's be let, let's get smart and and let's uh, let's be in good shape, which which Mike is on a, a fantastic uh, fantastic job at. Uh, now, I mean, I'm I'm the youngest guy in the group, but um, you know, very often now they I, mean, I used to be the, the first at the top of the hill. Now I, I struggle to catch up with them, and you know, it just <laughs> a, you know, group of friends meeting. We get beers after that. Uh, Brent Johnson is a I mean, his personality, real life personality, is just as nice as his personality on, on Twitter, and he's just one of the nicest guys I've met, funniest guy. So I, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm kind of the young guy there, so I, I tend to listen more than I speak, uh, and I'm, I'm really fortunate to, to have met the, these guys, and I've, I mean, I've learned so much from them. I mean, it's, it's one of the beauty, and I know you're very active on Twitter. I think it's one of the ways I think the, the industry has changed for the better is. Um, you know, it's much easier to make connections with people. If you have something smart to say, people will eventually pick it up. You can get into conversation with people that you would have never, I, you know, I would have never hoped to speak with you, you know, 10 years ago. So, and, and yet here we are. So yep. there, there is, I mean, we spend a lot of time, you know, talking about the, the evils of big tech, which, which I, I share with it, but there is also a positive aspect. Like if you're looking for good content on YouTube, like, like the channel you put out, if you want to have conversations with smart people, you can do that. You don't longer need to be, you know, a CFA, Goldman Sachs, a X years of Wall Street. It's, it's flattened the game. And I hope we can, I hope we can get rid of the negative effect of, of big tech on society, but also keep this kind of uh, free flow of idea mm-hmm. and democratization of, of finance. Well, I, I, I completely agree. Uh, I mean, it's, it's opened up a world to me to see how people react to my Twitter. It, it's, it's a very gratifying, n- not the ones in the middle of the night. I can deal without them. But um, I, so I've got, I've got one final question here. So you're, you're out, out towards the wine country, and you're, but you're a Frenchman uh, living in California. So I've got to ask, uh, when it comes to the important things in life, which are wine and cheese, mm-hmm. uh, which is better, French or California? Uh, cheese, I don't think there should be a debate here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 it's true. I mean, even in the, in the process, like, you know, you can't use raw milk in the U.S. I mean, you can get decent cheese in California, but uh, the, the variety of, I uh, think Charles de Gaulle had this, um, he was being frustrated with the French one time and said, how can you rule a country with 500 different kinds of cheeses? Um, which spoke to the truth that one, the fact that the French are grumpy and unruly, and two, that they make really delicious cheese. Uh, so I don't think there should be a debate there. Uh, on the wine, I mean, it's, I, I, at this point, it's a matter of taste. I mean, obviously, you have fantastic wines coming up Napa, Sonoma, Oregon, uh, Washington. I mean, for me, a lot of them taste a little bit too sweet. I'm, you know, I'm from Burgundy, so I, I like the, you know, the, the, the Pinots, but I am, my taste bud has kind of got used to it now. I like the Chardonnay here. So, um, I mean, with wines, I think, you know, you know, it, it, there's nothing that's better or worse. It's just whatever you like, whatever feels better, what you eat, the company you're in. I mean, you know, I, I think also people take these things a little too seriously. I mean, you know, wine is just, you know, something to be enjoyed with a good meal with friends. It's not something to showcase social status or, you know, you, I don't want to talk for like, you know, 15 minutes about, you know, the, the color of the wine. It's, I, I want to enjoy it. And, and California wine is, you know, very enjoyable. Well, that was spoken like a true Frenchman. 
Absolutely. And we should. And you're right. Uh, I hope one day we can have a glass of wine in person. It would be great to, uh, to meet you on some future. And I love Italian wine, by the way. So you're I mean, you're the ones who came up with it. Uh, so this is a gift of, of the Romans to the Gauls. So uh, as many things, the French just stole what the Italians did and, and Pritane was ours. <laughs> it's actually true. Even though the Medici sent away um, the, the second biggest wine family into exile into Burgundy years ago. Um, but that's a different story for a different day. Uh, I, Vincent, I want to thank you for all of the time that you've spent and I hope to, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe one day I'll sit you and Mike Green down together and the three of us can can finally figure out uh, the secret to to passive and whether or not we're ever going to see peak passive or whether we're going to get to that 100 percent mark and then the world will end. But I really, really appreciate your time and I wish you the best and look forward to, to doing this again sometime. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much. Have a great day. You too. Take care. Well, you may think that the that the idea of passive investing or exchange traded funds or the way your 401k automatically grabs a portion of your paycheck uh, before you get paid, you may think that it's a really boring issue. But when you consider that it's gone from a tiny slice of the stock market to now where it dominates the stock market, understanding passive inv investing is really important because that's possibly one of the largest bubbles that we've ever seen in, in U.S. stock market history. And again, most American workers are kind of blind to the role that it's playing in planning out their retirement. So if you enjoyed that discussion with Vincent, I, I, I suggest that you go back. I've done two interviews with Mike Green. So go back and, and, and watch those as well, because I think understanding passive investing and understanding the ETFs you just happen to own in your 401k is going to be more and more critical as a factor of time. and uh, and. For now, I will, I will say goodbye and look forward to the next time that you are back with me on Down the Middle. Thanks. Take care.